to the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. My name is April Federico, a sophomore sociology and Spanish double major here at St. Anselm College and a Kevin B. Harrington student ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this evening's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Tonight we'll hear from Thomas Apt, a lecturer and senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Thomas received a BA in econ economics from the University of Michigan and a law degree with honors from the Georgetown University Law Center. In addition, he has held senior positions in the Obama and Cuomo administrations where he has worked to improve public safety and reduce crime. Tonight, Thomas will present <coughs> the latest evidence concerning what works to reduce urban violence in America's cities identifying se several promising strategies with demonstrated track records of success. He will also explore political challenges associated with helping strategies break through in today's crowded criminal justice conversation. The closely related issues of gun control, police reform, and mass incarceration will also be addressed. <coughs> There will be a question and answer period following Thomas's remarks. Please wait until the student ambassador with the microphone reaches you. Without further ado, please join the Institute in welcoming Mr. Thomas Apt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, April. Thank, well, thank you, Anne Command, Professor Bidlock. Uh, the Institute of Politics and of course St. Anselm College. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. I had no idea the traffic was gonna be so crazy getting out of uh, Cambridge and Boston. Uh, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm gonna give a relatively short, uh, uh, short presentation uh, about some of the research uh, that, I've, uh, that I've performed with sociologist Chris Winship at Harvard. And then uh, I'd really like to open it up to a, a broader and informal discussion, really about um, how do we meet the moment in terms of this era of criminal justice reform. It's really an extraordinary time, and, uh, and so it's a, it's a great time to uh, discuss it, particularly with an election coming up. So uh, first off, let's just take a look at the numbers. Uh, Last, uh, a couple weeks ago, the FBI released its annual crime numbers. Uh, and these crime numbers are sort of the last word uh, in terms of crime trends in the United States. It's the Unify, uh, Unified Crime Report. Uh, and, for 20, and these numbers were released for 2015. Don't ask me why uh, in you know, this modern tech age it takes uh, the FBI, you know, uh, eight, nine, ten months to compile these uh, statistics, but unfortunately it does. So for 2015, we had approximately uh, 1,500, uh, uh, 15,000, 16, uh, 15,700 homicides. That's about an 11% increase uh, from the previous year, which is a very significant uh, increase. Um, it happened mostly in urban areas. Uh, homicide is up in most large cities in the United States. You may have seen reporting that said that a lot of this increase was uh, limited to a few cities. Uh, it's true that a few cities have driven the biggest rise, but there have been smaller rises uh, throughout the country. Um, violent crime uh, overall, not just homicide, is up. But it's important to note that property crime is down and that crime overall is flat. Uh, and this year is a little bit of a replay of 2014, last year. And uh, everything, and you know, from what we can see with the data, 2016 will be similar, meaning that we are likely to see a continuing uh, uptick in violence while overall crime uh, remains flat and that that uh, uptick in violence is concentrated in urban areas, often in neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage. 
Uh, so, you know, what are we to make of this? Uh, you know, you're hearing uh, from uh, some commentators that this is a national crime wave. You're hearing from sort of uh, Donald Trump that this is a catastrophe. You're hearing from some progressive commentators there's nothing to see here. How do we make sense of all this? So I think it's important to know that there is not an overall increase in crime. Uh, there's an increase in violent crime, and that violent crime is concentrated, as I said, in these uh, urban neighborhoods uh, that are quite disadvantaged. Uh, but that it doesn't mean that that uh, spike in violence is not real, and that it's not happening all across the country. Yes, uh, yes, we see the biggest uh, spikes in Baltimore, in Chicago in uh, places like St. Louis uh, and, and other places. But there are modest increases uh, in many other places. And some places you haven't heard about. San Antonio has a very large spike uh, in homicide. But it's also important to keep this in context. Uh, these increases bring us back to 2009, uh, meaning that this uh, we've had decreases since 2009, and these recent increases last year and this year take us back to 2009 level. 2009 was a relatively peaceful year. It's about 30 to 35 percent uh, of the, or uh, it's 35 to 30, 30 to 35 percent less homicides than we had in 1991, uh, which was the peak homicide year um, over the last maybe 50 to uh, 70 years um, for uh, homicides in America. So I think the way I would characterize uh, these latest numbers and this jump in homicide is it's a cause for real concern, but it's not a cause for panic. So what do we do about it? So I want to tell you a little bit about a systematic meta review uh, that myself and Chris Woodship performed, but I want to just talk a little bit about my uh, approach to criminal justice uh, policy. Uh, I am an advocate of something called uh, evidence-informed policy. It's something, uh, some people call it evidence-based policy. And basically what that means is that I try to look at rigorous data and, uh, evalu and evaluations to see what has worked in the past and to, and to look, it's not an ideology-based uh, system. It's also not a sort of conventional wisdom-based system. But the idea is, Using rigorous methods, how can we identify what works and how can we learn from it? I sort of paraphrase evidence-based policy as the uh, worst form of policy, accepting all others. Sort of what Churchill said about democracy. Democracy is the worst form of government except for every other form of government. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what a systematic review is, because that's sort of a critical concept for you to understand my approach and many other people's approach when they talk about evidence-informed or evidence-based policy. What a systematic review is, is it's a review of multiple studies. And so one of the things that you'll see in the, in the newspaper a lot is it'll, uh, people will say, oh, this new study says X. Uh, and the problem is, is that you often can't determine that much from a single study because you don't know whether the context of that study is generalizable to other contexts. That's a research, and we have a term for that in, uh, in the wonky research world, which is external validity. Is that study generalizable? Um, as opposed to internal validity, which is basically saying, is it a good study and can you rely on it in that specific context? And so systematic re reviews are an attempt to look at that, to sort of solve for that problem of external validity by taking, by synthesizing and reviewing multiple studies in a, in a particular area. So you don't say, well, this one study on policing uh, says this. You say, we looked at this uh, particular policing strategy, and we looked at all the possible uh, studies concerning this, and we found 25 studies, and so on and so forth. So that's the sort of value of a review. The systemic portion of it is sort of suggests rigor, and this is an important transition that we're seeing uh, in the field. So previously, when you wanted to sort of know what, you know, what the state of the evidence was, or the state of the art in a particular field, usually in social science, you looked at the literature. 
and a literature review was done by someone smart, and they, and they read all the literature, and then they told you what they thought. The problem with that was you didn't really have any information about their methodology. You didn't know how they searched uh, for the reviews. You don't know how they decided to include things or exclude things. They didn't tell you anything about their mode of analysis. They didn't tell you um, anything about um, you know, the sort of guts of how they, how they did these things. It wasn't transparent. So basically what you had to do is you had to look at the author and sort of say, do I trust this person? Is this, is this person a smart person? Do they have a good reputation? And then you kind of just had to sort of go along, go along with it. We're increasingly moving away from literature reviews, although they still can be useful, to these things called systematic reviews, where we set out all the, t all the sort of guts and methodology of the search in advance. So I won't go into all of the different rules, but for instance, in this, in this report that we do, we spelled out all of our search terms that we use to electronically search. You can know all the different journals that we looked at. We talked about our inclusion and exclusion criteria, You know what languages we searched in, the dates that we searched, the, ser the outcomes that we were looking for. Generally speaking, we were looking for crime, victimization, and disorder outcomes. Um, and so you can sort of understand all those things. So you don't have to trust me and Chris that we actually did this right. You can trust the methodology because you can see it right there in front of you. So that's a little bit about uh, a systematic review. And what we did is we did a review of reviews because what we wanted to look at is what do we know about how to reduce what we call community violence, which is sort of like street violence, urban violence, it, you know, intersects with youth violence, gang violence, gun violence. It's that kind of violence. It's not family violence. It's not formally declared wars between states. It's sort of, uh, uh, the, in many ways, the kind of violence that preoccupies us and the violence that is driving this increase over the past uh, couple of years. So we wanted to look at this field very broadly. There was no way that we were going to have enough time to look at all the individual studies. But there was, but with the help of several uh, talented research assistants, we could look at all of the reviews. So this is a review of reviews. So we searched the leading databases, journals, and gray literature. Uh, gray literature is, uh, is a term that uh, stands for unpublished studies. Uh, and you do that because you want to co uh, correct for publication bias, because basically, Generally speaking, people only publish studies when they find something out, when they find, found something worked. And so you want to be looking for other studies where they may have not have published because the intervention didn't work. So we searched, uh, we searched uh, these sources in the Americas, in the Caribbean, in Europe. We focused on community violence and we focused on rigorous evidence. The thing I want to sort of get across to you about rigorous evidence is rigorous and an evidence for me and my colleagues is a synonym for causal evidence, meaning evidence that can, uh, that can identify a causal effect, a before and then after effect. And so a lot of times when you hear this, uh, you probably, some of you may have heard this term, correlation does not equal causation. Well, that's exactly the kind of issue that I'm trying that we are trying to correct for, meaning we're trying to correct and only look at causal evidence. And generally what causal evidence is, is it's evidence that has a comparison group, meaning that you don't look just before and after an event, intervention and compare, uh, and compare uh, outcomes. You look at a comparison group, and then you assess the quality of that comparison group. The best kind of group uh, study is something called a randomized controlled trial. I won't get into the weeds on that. So we ran our search terms. We came up with about over 5,000 hits um, uh, that we narrowed that down through abstract reviews, you know, reading the, the very beginning of those studies to about 188 uh, reviews. Uh, our our uh, diligent research assistants uh, reviewed all 188 of them, read them entirely. Uh, and then we selected probably, for Chris and I, probably about 60 in total, and then about 43 met our uh, final eligibility criteria. Those 43 studies aggregated, meaning they were 
they uh, summarized over 1,400 studies. Um, and uh, one thing you should know is that, unfortunately, most of the rigorous evidence on crime and on many issues has been generated in high-income countries. So overwhelmingly, our evidence came from the United States, a little bit from Europe, a little bit from Canada, but not from other, um, other places, even though we looked. So what, is our, what did we find? One of the things that we found is this very powerful finding, which, is, which sort of 30 years of social science has sort of built up to this conclusion that violence is sticky. It's highly concentrated in a, among a small number of places, people, and behaviors. And, it, and you can see here uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, statistics. So in Boston, 1% of youth are responsible for over 50% uh, of shootings. 5% of city, I'm sorry, that should say city blocks, are responsible for 70% of total shootings. In Minneapolis, 50% of uh, calls for police service come from 3% of the addresses. And in most cities, 0.05% of the population is responsible for 75% of the homicides. I think we all know intuitively that crime concentrates in certain neighborhoods and among uh, certain groups of people. But what we don't know, and what the social science is telling us, is in fact it concentrates much more than that. Violence doesn't concentrate in a dangerous neighborhood. It concentrates in maybe two, three, or four micro locations, or, or otherwise known as hotspots, in that neighborhood. And what does that look like? That looks like a particular intersection. That's a particular liquor store. That's a particular nightclub. That's a particular drug house. It's that level of specificity. And it's those specific addresses, those specific blocks, those specific corners that are generating a tremendous amount of the crime and violence. And that's why you can live in a danger, a quote unquote dangerous neighborhood. And if you're on the right street, you, have a, you can have a relatively uh, you know, peaceful existence. Whereas if you go one, two, three streets over, it could be a very different reality. The same is true for people. You know, um, we'll, we might talk later about sort of New York, the New York Police Department and stop and frisk and their choice to, in certain areas where, uh, where you know, rates of violence were high, to sort of inundate the area with stop and frisk and, you know, uh, and you know, stopping and searching, uh, generally speaking, young men of color. Well, the, the interesting thing is, yes, violence does concentrate in those areas where NYPD went, and it does generally concentrate among these young men of color, both as offenders and as victims. It's important to remember that these young men are also victims. But the problem is they didn't get specific enough, because in fact, even in a dangerous neighborhood, even among the young men in that dangerous neighborhood, only a small percentage of them are actually responsible for the most serious crime and violence. Uh, a good example is when you look at the typical gang in the United States. Uh, most gangs in the United States, uh, unless you're sort of in certain areas of Chicago or uh, um, LA or you know, in, in the West Coast, um, most of our gangs in the United States are quite disorganized. They might not even really sort of rise to the level of gangs. They're crews, they're cliques, they're sort of a group, a small, unruly <coughs> group of young men who sort of grew up together and they call themselves X, Y, Z, but they're not particularly organized or particularly hierarchical. However, they can be quite dangerous and quite deadly. And so if you look at the typical gang in the United States, maybe 15, 20 young men, all of them grew up, grew up together, and you're looking at a particular vi particularly violent gang responsible for multiple homicides, you might think, oh my god, any one of these uh, members of this gang must be fearsome, must be totally dangerous. Not so. In fact, our research and our data and our criminal intelligence tells us that in most gangs, most gangs only have, in a group of 20 or 30 young men, two or three shooters. And the shooters are people who are reliably, when the gang has a conflict, the people who can be depended on to pick up the gun and do the shooting. So even among a gang, we need to get specific. We need to be uh, selective. You know, we have to figure out, is this, you know, is this person in the gang sort of a shot caller? Are they a shooter? Or are they a wannabe? Are they just a hanger on? Are they somebody's cousin who just goes to the parties? So these are the kinds of things we've got to think about.
Um, it won't surprise you that the sticky strategies to uh, reduce crime and violence are turning out to be most effective. And so what we see is the more selective we are, the mo more focused we are, the more targeted we are, generally the better we're doing. And that's true in policing, that's true in gang reduction, and that's true in reentry or recidivism reduction, meaning helping ex-offenders reenter society. So this is a very important finding. Many of you, when you probably, your first instinct when you think about crime is to say, well, it's all about family values, or it's all about community values, or it's all about poverty, or it's all about inequality, or it's all about guns, a very broad-based idea. And it's not that those things have no relationship, but it's important to understand that when you actually get under the hood of these things, that crime is much more specific. So for instance, you know, uh, take poverty. Well, yes, you know, most of the young men who are involved in the, uh, these shootings, either as offenders or victims, they're poor, they're disenfranchised, they're disadvantaged in all of these different ways. They probably have obstacles to employment, all of these different things. But if you go across the street, there's another young man, all the same uh, structural issues, not involved in gang violence. You go, you go down the block, another young man, all the same issues, not involved in gang violence, not involved in gang <coughs> violence. So you've got to get more specific than that. So this is just something to think of. Now, a key issue is specificity, this targeted, targeted, concentrated, sticky approach, is not going to work if every time you go to a hotspot or every time you focus on a specific person, the crime just moves around the corner. Or if crime goes down the block, or if this person stops, uh, you know, stops their activities but someone else fills their, fills their place. And that's a very sort of common sense uh, idea. It's, uh, some people call it the balloon effect of crime, where you squeeze one end of the balloon and the other end expands. Um, and it's actually sort of responsible for a lot of pessimism in criminal justice. And a lot of people sort of, for a long time, felt like, well, you know, there's really not a lot we can do uh, to fight crime because, you know, you push it down here and it comes uh, over here. Many people in law enforcement used to think that. Fortunately, one of the strongest findings over the past 30 years is it just ain't so. And so what we know is that the displacement effect, meaning if you focus on crime here, is crime displaced to you know, the surrounding neighborhoods? It isn't, and we've seen that again and again and again. And in fact, what we're seeing is a diffusion of benefits. I don't know why we choose such complicated terms uh, to express this, but what it basically means is is that if there's an anti-crime uh, initiative you know, next door to you or in, in the neighborhood next to you, you're actually more likely to experience benefits rather than displacement. That doesn't mean that displacement never happens. It does happen. But the, but the displacement is generally not as significant as the crime that is reduced. The other thing to keep in mind is that the violence that we're talking about is typically relatively disorganized. The violence that we're talking about, and this is most homicide, it's not a majority of homicide, but it's probably the largest single group of homicide, is this sort of retaliatory tit for tat between groups of young men or over disputes over a girl, you know, um, it's quite disorganized. It might be over an insult posted on Facebook, uh, and and so it is not highly organized. And so one of the things to keep in mind is that when crime is highly organized, it's more capable of being displaced. So for instance, you know, if we're talking about the drug cartels in Mexico, and you shut down one drug uh, drug route, what does the cartel do? It just picks up and establishes another route. So this isn't, these strategies that I'm talking about aren't a solution to all crime, all violence everywhere, but they can be effective in these circumstances. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, two of the most effective strategies that we reviewed of the sort of 43 that met our inclusion criteria in the systematic uh, uh, manner <coughs> review. And the first one is called focused deterrence. It's also known as ceasefire, and it got its start in Boston in the early 1990s. You may have heard of something called the Boston Miracle, where uh, crime, crime and violence were quite high in Boston, and there was a very rapid reduction, and for a period of sort of two or three years in the 90s, 
There was not a single juvenile homicide. Uh, ceasefire was associated with that, uh, with that significant uh, drug. So let me tell you a little bit about focus deterrence, aka ceasefire. It begins with identifying specific offenders and offending groups, you know, cliques, gangs, groups, things like that, that are responsible for most of the shooting. And so, again, specificity. It doesn't work with everyone. It, it, it identifies the people most likely to shoot or be shot. And then it pulls together a group of civic, community, and criminal justice uh, stakeholders <coughs> to mobilize uh, in, uh, uh, to address these specific offenders and offending, uh, offending groups. And then that group confronts this group of offenders in what's known as a calling, meaning they literally call in the gang members and sit them down in a meeting maybe this size. Uh, the reason they can do that and the reason the gang members show up is because many of them are on probation or on parole and they don't have much of a choice. Uh, and, so in, and so what happens is this, this group of uh, criminal justice and community leaders delivers a presentation. And the first uh, part of the presentation is law enforcement. And law enforcement, enforcement deliver, delivers a very clear message. We know who you are. They put up their uh, photos, they show, who they, they, sh they show their criminal intelligence, show that they know that they're aligned with these various people, they show their criminal records, and they give a, a, a very good sense that they are on, that these offenders are on their radar. And then they go through all their criminal exposure, and they make sure that the, uh, that the people in the, in the audience understand that because of their criminal records, they're subject to enhanced punishments for all various different things, and they promise that if the shooting doesn't stop, and this is very important, they're not gonna just in, uh, come down on that particular offender, but they're gonna come down on the, the uh, offender's entire group of associates. And so the idea is, is that if you don't want increased law enforcement attention, stop the violence, stop the shooting. That doesn't mean they endorse the other types of behaviors that they might have, maybe drug selling, maybe, maybe, maybe something else. There's no endorsement of that. But they're saying, we're gonna prioritize the violence. Then, law enforcement sits down, the community stands up. Often, it's a mother who has lost a child to gun violence. And the message from the community is, what you're doing is wrong, what you're doing is hurting the community, but, you are still a member of this community. And if you will change, we want you back. And so they offer a, a sort of welcoming, redemptive message. And then service providers get up and say, look, we can help you uh, try to get some, uh, you know, we can try to help you address your outstanding warrants. We can try to help you with job training. We can try to help you get that GED certificate. So it's a balanced message. It's stick, but also care. <coughs> And then this plays out. So basically, what this, what this sort of multi-agency task force is doing is making a series of promises. Promises to enforce the law and promises to help. And the key issue is integrity, keeping your promises. And so as when, when these, uh, when these uh, you know, groups of uh, high-risk individuals go out and they either call for help or they shoot someone, you have to keep the promises. So you have to actually make good and lock up the people who you said you would lock up. And if people want to change and they need help, you have to help them. You can't put them to the back of the line in the normal sort of social service uh, type of thing. You have to really deliver. And then you repeat. And so six months later, you bring everybody together again. <coughs> Put, uh, you put various things up on the board. You say, remember the 13th Street crew and how we told them that we were gonna enforce and then they went out and sh uh, shot those two guys? Well, here's the one that's been uh, arrested, here's another one that's doing time, here's another one that's doing time. And then you show, you know, here's a bunch of guys who decided to clean up their act, they haven't been doing it, they've gotten jobs. And so the idea is you keep demonstrating that you're gonna keep your promises. This has been quite successful. As you can see, nine out of 10 uh, intervention studies were, affected, uh, were effective. And actually, more recently, this was performed in 2012, we've had some recent studies in New Orleans and elsewhere 
that are showing uh, continued effectiveness. It's not a panacea. It's not easy to do. Often this type of strategy falls apart because you can't get the partners to work together effectively. But when it, uh, but when it works, and if you can do it properly, uh, it has a high rate of success. So, on the other, another a very effective strategy that we found was something called cognitive behavior, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, <coughs> CB, or or otherwise known as CBT. Uh, CBT is not what you might think of when you think of therapy. It's not Freudian. It's not let's talk about mommy and dad. <coughs> it's talking about your thinking and how your thinking leads to behavior, and particularly with high-risk individuals, it's talking about how distorted or problematic thinking, often related to uh, anger management, often related to interpersonal problem solving, or sort of future-oriented expectation or impulsivity, how that thinking and act leads to actions and consequences that that person may not have anticipated or may not have wanted. Uh, and and it's very concrete. So you walk through a situation, you might role play it, and then you practice the situation to get a different um, outcome. It's very flexible, it's very adaptable, it works with both kids and adults, it works in a community setting, it works in a correctional setting, um, it works on its own or, at, or is paired with like an employment program uh, or with a sports program, and it's relatively neutral. It's not, uh, it doesn't sort of impute a sort of certain set of values. So it can be done in a wide variety of contexts. Let me give you sort of an example. The classic CBT is something uh, that we've all probably heard about, which is when you're really angry, uh, what did your parents tell you to do before you did anything? They might have told you to count to 10. That's classic CBT. That's classic CBT, which says give yourself a moment before reacting to think, to think, think this thing through. Another uh, strategy uh, from um, Chicago, a very well-known program called Becoming a Man, uh, focuses on um, how to get the something you want. And so they'll have a group of young men and they'll divide them into pairs and they'll give one, of the, uh, one person in each pair a tennis ball. And they'll say, okay, you have 60 seconds to get that tennis ball. Go. All heck breaks loose. They all start, you know, wrestling each other, or chasing each other around, you know, and uh, it's pandemonium. So time is called. They bring them all back together. They're all panting, and, and, they, and then they ask one of them to come up, and one comes up. He's got the tennis ball, and uh, and the uh, moderators or lead, uh, group leader says, "Let me show you another strategy." Um, you know, John, could I see that tennis ball for a moment? Would you mind? And the kid, of course, is like, well, okay. And the point is to model a different strategy, saying, you know, don't always go to force, threat, the things. Think about, there are times where if you ask for something nicely, you will get it. Um, so the evidence, uh, the evidence um, supporting this, as you can see, 58 studies, 19 of which are RCTs, Again, what I said, randomized controlled trials, the highest quality level of evidence, uh, show a relatively large decrease in recidivism, meaning the likelihood that you'll uh, uh, um, become arrested for a crime or something like that. Uh, but when it's done well, and, it's, and it can be done well fairly frequently, you can get recidivism reductions of 50%. And this is not the finding of just uh, Mark Lipsy, but many, many other systematic reviews have found. So those are the two sort of big rock stars that we found in our report. But we looked at a lot of different other strategies. Um, and you can see some of the things that we found. I'll just go through this uh, pretty quickly. So um, hotspots policing, uh, which is uh, policing that focuses on those uh, little micro locations that I talked about, and broken windows policing, both moderately effective. Surprisingly, community policing has not been effective. Um, in reducing crime and violence. It has small improvements in legitimacy associated with it, but it's not effective in reducing crime and violence. Also, uh, broken windows has been pretty controversial uh, recently. I want to just break down what I mean by broken windows. Interestingly, 
when Broken Windows is done in a very narrow, uh, targeted way, and in partnership with the community, it's quite effective, and it doesn't trigger any community resistance. But if you do Broken Windows like they did in New York, sort of aggressive order maintenance, zero tolerance, unfocused, it's less effective at reducing crime, and it triggers resistance. So again, think about stickiness. Um, and as you can see, targeting and problem solving and legitimacy are all uh, important components there. SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design, um, you know, improving street lighting, uh, you know, using cameras to surveil areas, uh, reducing, uh, you know, uh, overgrown vegetation and things like that. And urban rene renewal strategies are only modestly effective. They do some something, but not a tremendous amount. So what that means is, is that, and these are enormously popular. What this means is, is that it's not that you shouldn't try these strategies, but they can't be your only approach. If you think that just by investing and you know beautifying a neighborhood, uh, that you're going to turn that neighborhood around, particularly if it has high rates of violent crime, that hasn't been the case. You might have a modest effect, but you're going to need to pair that intervention or group that intervention with others. Um, we talked about focused deterrence and CBT. Family-based strategies uh, are moderately effective. They're particularly effective when they target higher risk families, families that are more likely to have members who might get involved in violence. Interestingly, school-based strategies and vocational training, a very mixed record, not particularly effective. And I think one of the reasons is because job training, when it is done, uh, when it is simply job training, doesn't have that behavioral component that CBT has. And so what you'll find often with this sort of high risk group of people is if you don't address their underlying thinking and underlying behavior, if you give them housing, they have a fight with their roommate and they get kicked out. If you give them a job, they can't get along with their boss and they get fired. If you put them in drug treatment, they don't stay. And so it's not that those services aren't important, but you can't simply throw those services or resources at someone, someone who's you know, hypervigilant, has been through an enormous amount of trauma, has, you know, has, you know, has not been taught effective life skills, and expect them to just make, good, uh, make the best of it. And so this is an important idea, which is the concept of wraparound services is a good one, but you can't simply deliver the services and not address the underlying cognition and the underlying be behavior. School-based strategies uh, have had limited effect uh, effectiveness, um, and I think and I think the reason is is a, a sort of very fairly common sense one, which is the most violent young people are not in school, or if they are in school, they're in school sporadically. So you may be delivering a great treatment to uh, kids who are in school, but that's going to address you know, fighting in school, maybe, to, uh, maybe a little bit uh, else. But it's not going to address the gang violence that's happening outside, because those gang members are not often in school, even if they're of school age. Uh, risk needs responsivity rehabilitation is effective. And this is something that's important to know. If you do evidence-based uh, uh, rehabilitation. It is effective. What risk needs responsivity means is working with higher risk people, analyzing their individual needs, and, and then responding to them. And so one of the fascinating things that we've learned about offender reentry is that we used to say, okay, we have a certain amount of uh, reentry dollars. Who should we spend those on? Well, let's spend them on the lowest risk people, the people who are most <laughs> likely to do great with and then we did a bunch of uh, studies, and we uh, uh, we looked at our we looked at our work, and it turns out that reentry services for low risk people increase their risk of recidivism. You're actually doing harm because what you're doing is you're interrupting their natural pr uh, protective factors that made them low risk. And what we find is the more you concentrate your resources on high risk populations and high dosages, so if someone has been through a lot and they've you know, done a lot and you, know, you really want to turn them around, you know, one hour a week is not going to cut it. You've got to have a much more intensive dosage. And so you've got to work with them multiple days a week, multiple hours a day. 
uh, to really start getting under the hood. Uh, interestingly, control strategies for juveniles have not been effective. So one of the things you might have heard of, scared straight. Scared straight is famously ineffective among crime nerds like myself. Scared straight actually makes kids more likely to turn to crime, not less. Boot camps, also not effective. And juvenile curfews, not effective. Um, <coughs> interestingly, I want to draw an interesting contrast between guns and drugs here. What we found when we looked at systematic reviews is that aggressive gun enforcement, meaning gun patrols, you know, police patrolling the streets, looking for people carrying weapons, stopping them and recovering those weapons. That was effective in reducing gun crime and other forms of, of crime. But gun prevention, sort of gun buybacks and broad-based prevention was less effective. Uh, and partly, uh, again, sort of like the school strategy, when you do a gun buyback, even though they're incredibly popular and people love to do them, they get lots of good press. What do you get? You usually get some gun that grandma's had you know, around the house for 50 years, it's you know, not operable, and it's, you're not actually getting weapons that are likely to be used. And so you're really just sort of uh, scratching, uh, scratching the surface. Now, contrast that with drug enforcement. It turns out that oftentimes effective, uh, aggressive drug enforcement has a destabilizing impact on drug markets, meaning that it creates more friction and competition between drug dealers, which leads to more violence. And we know that drug treatment is actually quite effective when it's done well, either through drug courts or in a, in a community setting. So is it, it's smart to get tough on guns, but apparently not so smart to get tough on drugs. And then targeted uh, gang enforcement, usually through focused deterrence, is effective but gang prevention, things like the rape program where like a cop will go into a school and say, hey kids, don't join gangs, uh, has not been that effective. And I think the reason, and that's sort of similar to the D.A.R.E. program, which is not part of this, uh, part of this study, but is you know, something that people know about. It's also famously ineffective. You should not go to a group of you know, uh, young teenagers and tell them, that you know, uh, all the grown-ups think that this thing, either drugs or gangs, are really bad. And if you want to make the grown-ups mad, you know, do these things. Because what it turns out is you're sort of you're sort of uh, putting this more on their on their radar screen. The other thing is that what we're finding is a lot of times gang prevention programs seem to actually um, reaffirm a gang identity rather than undermine the gang identity. And because by constantly talking about the gangs, we sort of uh, actually increase gang cohesion. And so a lot of the sort of latest thinking in this area is to stop focusing so much on the gang and just work on general juvenile delinquency. Just work with the individual kids to get them on the right path, <coughs> rather than focusing on the gang so much. So I also want to talk about legitimacy. Because if anybody's glanced at the headlines, legitimacy is a huge issue. Uh, but I also want to note that legitimacy and violence are intimately connected. And some of you may have heard of something called the Ferguson Effect, where uh, some, uh, some commentators say that because of this uh, increase in police criticism and all the stuff that's happening on social media, and in the 24-hour news cycle that cops are scared to get out of their cars, so they don't really do the policing, so the criminals are running the streets. Uh, there's very little strong evidence for that effect. It happened a little bit in Baltimore. It happened a little bit, maybe happening a little bit in Chicago. It happened for a few weeks in New York. But in terms of explaining the national rise in homicides, it's not a particularly powerful explanation. That doesn't mean it never happens for a little bit of time, but it's not the most powerful explanation. A more powerful explanation is this legitimacy effect. And what we've learned is that when a community believes that, uh, that the criminal justice system, that police, that prosecutors, that judges are either unable or unwilling to help them, they turn inward um, and, uh, and they don't report crimes to the police. They don't serve as witnesses. They don't serve as jurors. And they engage in something 
that researchers have quite clinically called self-help. And what that means on the street is if somebody beats up your cousin, you don't call the police, you round up your boys, and you handle it. And so what you find is that the, the, you know, the original purpose of law enforcement, which was to sort of obviate the need for retaliatory violence, you don't need to you know, police your, the, the boundaries of your farm because there are, there's a police force to do that. And when you're injured, you don't have to go attack the person yourself. You can bring this to the magistrate or those types of things. That, that social contract is breaking down. And so you've got to supply your own law and justice. And so that's a much better explanation for what we see happening um, around the country. What you see happening around the country is poor communities of color um, are you know, hearing in a massive increase about these instances of misconduct. Um, police misconduct, police violence, and all of these, uh, all of these different things. And there are real issues, and so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't minimize them. But when they hear about those things, it makes them even less likely to trust the system. And there are real consequences to that. I don't want to overblow this because you know there are a lot of sort of pet theories about why crime goes up or down, like video games or movies or those things. Most of those things don't really have much impact at all. There's actually some evidence that violent video games and violent movies are actually have a have a positive effect on violence. So, but what I'm what I'm suggest what I what we see in the data is that when you have this sort of overall trend, and then you have a highly publicized local incident of police misconduct, police misuse of force. Think St. Louis, think Chicago, think Milwaukee, think Baltimore. Then you see a really pronounced legitimacy effect. That's the real Ferguson effect. And so that's really something uh, to think about. I also want you to think a little bit about how these sticky strategies that I've talked about might actually be really uh, also uh, pro-legitimacy strategies. Because think about it. One of the objections that many people have to the current policing strategies is that they're overbroad. They treat the entire neighborhood like they're the enemy. Or they treat every young man in a, in a neighborhood like they're the enemy. Or they say, say that poor black people are the enemy, or Mexicans are the enemy, or, or, you know, or Muslims are the enemy. And what these specific strategies say is they say within any community, within any region, the number of good people vastly outnumbers the number of bad people. And that, we can, and, and that you can enlist the broader community in trying to enforce the law or prevent future crimes from happening uh, by, the, by the few. So that's uh, something to think about. Effectiveness and legitimacy are not, uh, in economic terms, uh, substitutes for one another. They're not in tension with one another. They're complements. You can have both at the same time. So this is uh, something that in a recent op-ed that, uh, that I published, uh, because I was trying to think about how can I sort of summarize how, if I was given a magic wand, how to reduce violence across the United States in a significant way. And I would do these four steps. Number one, in every city that had a high rate of violence, I would do an analysis and I would identify these clusters of violence, these specific people, places, and behaviors that were driving that violence. So I would isolate it and say, okay, the entire city is not violent, the entire poor neighborhood is not violent, the entire group of people is not violent, let's, let's make this problem small. Then, in each city, I would share that information with a wide array of stakeholders using something known as procedural justice, which is a, a, a sort of a, um, a process by which you get feedback and, uh, and uh, it's a very inclusive process for sort of reaching uh, outcomes. To build a common understanding of the challenge. So everybody was on the same page uh, on that. Then, using the, once we were all on the same page, then I would select a balanced set of strategies. Some enforcement, some prevention. 
but all focus on those people, places, and behaviors that matter most. And then I would implement them carefully and follow up evaluating and monitoring process. process. So, and the interesting thing about this is think about the strategies that I've uh, told you about today. Because they're so focused, they don't break the bank, they don't require new legislation, and they're politically relatively nonpartisan. They're not particularly conservative and they're not particularly progressive. Um, and, well, I'll, I know, so I'll come back to that in a moment. The other thing I want to talk to you about is, um, uh, you know, oftentimes we think of violence as the inevitable outcome of structural factors like poverty, inequality, systematic racism, lack of opportunity, and things like that. I want you to think about that causal relationship, that if-then relationship, as running in both directions, meaning does high levels of violence perpetuate poverty? Does it increase inequality? Does it, uh, does it uh, reduce business investment? Does it do all of these different things and, and impede us in uh, achieving our broader social outcomes? And in fact, the evidence is showing, uh, is emerging what right now, that in fact it really does. So uh, a sort of landmark study on uh, uh, income mobility from Raj Chetty at Harvard and others has shown that high rates of violent crime are strongly associated with reduced income mobility. Now, that word associated is important. That means not causal. That means it seems to be associated, but they're not sure you know, why that association is. They can't control for every factor. So that's sort of an, a hint. But then, Pat Sharkey and his colleagues in, uh, in, in, at NYU uh, this year went further and did even more rigorous research using something called instrumental variables and blah, 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 blah. I won't get into the details. But they basically showed that violence is a central mechanism in perpetuating uh, poverty. And it does that by impacting the life chances of children it, and, and by making it much harder to pay attention, much harder to study, much harder to achieve educational outcomes that are essential to future more mobility. And it also destroys the community. It, it creates disinvestment. It creates uh, out-migration and, and, other, and other issues, as you can see. And the impacts of violence, we're really only starting to fully appreciate the impacts of violence uh, now. Not only does it impair cognitive uh, development, it disrupts sleep, it leads to future aggression, substance use, depression, obesity, and illness later in life. If you, one of the things that we, we see is that if you have witnessed, you have a, a high rate of adverse childhood experiences, experiences that are uh, highly traumatic, that can not only lead to all these different risky behaviors, drug abuse, smoking, et cetera, et cetera. It can actually lead to, even if you don't engage in those risky behaviors, higher rates of cancer much later on in life. And so we're really only beginning to scratch the surface there. So I want you to think about, instead of thinking always about going from the outside in, let's solve every other problem before we solve violence. Maybe we should be solved working from the inside out, prioritizing violence to reach these other outcomes. Um, and so that's, that's my point here. So, you know, if these strategies could have major impacts on reducing inequality, improving poverty, uh, and they're cost effective and they're politically neutral, why aren't we doing them? Why is this so hard? Well, one of the reasons is because implementing what works, meaning what's proven through causal evidence to be effective, is not easy. First of all, someone like me has to synthesize all this evidence, has to do the hard work of telling you what 1,400 studies collectively say. And that's not, e uh, that's not easily done. And then implementing these strategies is not easy. The interesting thing is what you need is you need quality over quantity. And what we generally are good at doing, especially in government, is quantity over quality. So we can give a low intensity, low cost, low effectiveness program to millions of people. We can just dole that out, everybody gets a piece, and we spread the resources around, no hard choices need to be made, everybody gets their back scratched, easy to implement, 
easy to do. Government does it all the time. What's hard to do is say, no, we're going to focus on a few people because they're the people that really matter. And we're going to do a very intensive, very good job. We're going to deliver a high dosage, high quality in, uh, intervention. And that's very hard for government to do. For instance, one of the reasons that a lot of our strategies for fighting crime uh, you know, disproportionately rely on law enforcement is because law enforcement is the most dynamic government organization. Law enforcement runs 24-7. Law enforcement can create a task force overnight and you know, adopt a new strategy and get, and get specific. One of the big issues that we have is there's no comparable dynamic institution on the social services side. When are we going to have social workers who will go out at 3 a.m. in the morning to the most dangerous neighborhoods to make sure someone is you know, not out on the street and is in a, in a safe area, who can immediately respond to a condition? We need, we need that balance. Um, and we don't need it for everyone. We just need it for a few people. The other thing, and, and I hope we can talk more about this, is our current narrative in criminal justice is fractured and extreme, and it has a number of distortions. So for instance, um, some people in the, so some people, so for instance, in the gun violence debate, people either think that guns are the solution to all of our problems, meaning that if we could just get all the guns off the street, all the violence would go away, and some people think that guns have nothing to do with it, and in fact there are cherished cherished uh, Second Amendment rights, and they have not, no relationship uh, to violence whatsoever. Same thing with policing. We either think police are the heroes, or we think they're the villains. And we're constant, or we think that crime is, uh, you know, just the matter, you know, is just a matter of individual choices or family choices, or it's just a function of broader social, socioeconomic uh, factors. Um, Mass incarceration um, is either driven by racism or it's driven by higher levels of offending. There's a problem with these choices. The first problem is that they are absolutes. Um, and, and, the, and forcing the public to choose between these absolutes is a false choice. Because in fact, you can often do both. Uh, uh, you can do, you know, it's possible to care about police reform and violent crime, as we've discussed uh, before. It's possible that it is true that there is systematic racism driving the incarceration problem in the United States, and that African Americans are also, also have higher levels of offending, and that those two things are happening at the same time, and it's not one or the other. It's also, it's also uh, true that in terms of gun violence, that yes, if we have legislation that outlawed um, you know, every gun or, 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 or regulated heavily guns, there is, there is evidence that shows that that would have a long-term impact on gun violence. But it's equally true that in a society with millions and millions of guns, more than one gun per person in the United States, if you pass that gun, all those laws uh, today, next week, next month, next year, it would have a very modest effect. So these absolutes are hurting the conversation, and it makes it harder for these sticky strategies to break through. And then the last thing I just want to ask is, how much do we really care about this? And what I mean by that is, who's really being impacted? Who um, are the offenders? Who are the victims? Who in that t last year and this year and probably, uh, and, you know, probably next year who are these numbers really going to impact? Is it going to impact, I don't want to assume anything, but is it going to impact the people in this room? Maybe not. It's going to impact poor people, black people, brown people, people who don't traditionally vote as much, don't have as much political power. And so it's much easier to, uh, to sort of look the other way on, on these issues. And one of the things that I want to th uh, you to think about is, one of the things that frustrates me about the sort of uh, criminal justice conversation, particularly as it uh, relates to race, is that when we're talking about race, it's always a question of racial animus. Do the cops hate black people? Does the criminal justice system hate 
black people or brown people or, 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 or these things. And that's, and there is, there is obviously some overt animus in the criminal justice system. But what we don't talk about is apathy. What we don't talk about is when the vast majority of us just don't care. Uh, because it's not happening to people that we know or people we care about. And so we don't pressure our representatives to do anything about these things, as long as that problem stays in a certain place around certain people. And it's really the apathy that is the real, that I believe is the real problem. And so uh, with that, I'd love to open up the conversation, get some questions, and get the conversation going. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I guess I just start with the last point about apathy. I, I think one of the arguments to make <coughs> criminal justice. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you also just identify yourself? Oh, I'm Peter Cordell. I'm a faculty member here in criminology and criminal justice. So. Ah, excellent. Uh, the whole idea that's becoming a bigger part of state budgets all the time. So if you and I agree with you. I mean, in terms of actually being victimized, no one in this room is likely to be victimized. You know, it's intra-racial, intra-class. So. It's not an issue, but we're shrinking tax revenue to go to uh, more and more services that we need. This is an area, and we've already started an off-road in terms of decreasing the prison population. But I, I think that that's one of the ways really to get to the public. You know, this kind of strategy as you're suggesting would save a significant amount of money and be more effective. But besides that, I just have one question for you in terms of that whole idea of legitimacy. Well, actually, two questions in one. One is, how do the studies measure this idea of sort of delegitimation? So how do we know? And I actually agree with your position that I think that that's really what's happening. But how do we measure that? Um, do right. we go survey people, or you know, how do we find that out? Right. Um, I'll, I'll tell you uh, about sort of two areas of surveys that give some sort of concrete uh, numbers, put some meat on the bones. Uh, the first is a study that actually just came out uh, last week uh, about um, Milwaukee. And it basically measures uh, calls to 911 before and after a highly publicized uh, incident <coughs> of police excessive force. Uh, it, was a, it was an incident many years ago. It's not a current incident. But what they saw is that after the uh, incident uh, became publicized, uh, that there was a massive decrease in calls to 911, and that 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 the, and that the decrease was mostly concentrated in poor African American minority neighborhoods. So, so we do see a pretty concrete connection. Horrible thing happens uh, in a local community, and then 911 calls go down. That's one example. The other is uh, in these studies uh, of uh, legal cynicism. And uh, we measure legal cynicism by taking a survey in a community and saying, you know, and we measure, you know, are the police here to help me? How do you, you know, how much trust do I have in the police and the courts and all of these things? And you can get sort of a sense of how much the, uh, the community trusts in the law and trusts in the criminal justice system. And then you uh, do that in a bunch of different communities and then you control for all the socioeconomic factors. And what we see is again, this is, this is not causal evidence. This is a correlation, not causation. But what we see is when you take out all those other factors, socioeconomic factors, uh, you know, poverty, education levels, and those things, communities with lower levels of trust in the system have higher levels of, uh, of violence. Um, and I'll give, you, I'll give you just an anecdote. Um, when I was in LA doing some of the field work for this, uh, for uh, the report that we did, um, I saw a great example of community policing, the um, Community Safety Partnership. And it uh, happened in uh, Watts, which is a neighborhood that's famous for sort of racial conflict and tension. But uh, police, uh, police community partnerships had really gelled in this neighborhood, and violence had gone down significantly. And so I was there, I was with some of the uh, sort of uh, street workers, the guys who actually who were not police, but who would talk to the gangs, 
and with the uh, police, and they were all talking about how they got along so well, and the community was really talking to them. And I said, okay, I, you know, I get it, great, kumbaya, I'm glad that we're all getting along, but how does this actually reduce violence? Why is there less shooting in this neighborhood? And they kind of looked at each other, they haven't really kind of thought about it that much. And then one of them said, well, you know, it gives us 48 hours. And the rest of the group sort of nodded. And what they meant by that is that when an incident occurred, a violent incident occurred, because of the relationships that they had, they had a window where they could get information out and say, we think we know who did this, we're going to make an arrest, you don't need to handle it yourself. Because one of the things that we see is that not only does violence you know, cluster in these time uh, in in space and among people and among behaviors. It clusters in time. So violence is often retaliatory. One shooting leads to another shooting, leads to another shooting, boom, 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 boom. You can have four or five in this period, period of, of days or a couple weeks. And, and that, those, that those trusting relationships minimizes that retaliation. So that gives you, that's not a, that's not a perfect answer, and, and I think that I would say my view is that this is the leading explanation, but as a criminologist, you know that it's very hard to sort of show these uh, things. Would you compare that to like the interrupters in Chicago who go out and they hear something's going to happen? And then I guess my follow-up question would be related to what you were talking about with CBT. Do you think they're doing a little bit of that at least in that kind of context? I mean, it's certainly not systematic. But yeah. So. You know, anybody who's like counseling someone, you know, relatively wisely is doing a little bit of CBT. But I think the point is, is that most of these programs only work when they're done really well and really intensively. So a little CBT here and there, we're already doing that. There's all, you know, there's already a million CBT programs out there that are doing, you know, are low quality and low dosage. It's these higher quality approaches that are effective. In terms of violence interrupters, this is a program that's famous in Chicago. It was also known as Ceasefire, just to make things extra confusing. It's now known as Cure, Cure Violence. Uh, this is a thing where uh, uh, these ex-gang members will go and insert themselves into gang conflicts and try to act as mediators. And uh, the, violent, the, the evidence on Cure Violence is quite mixed. Uh, it's reduced violence in some places. It's actually increased violence in other places. I actually like the LA model better because the, the gang workers work with the police and they're much more coordinated, as opposed to in Chicago where they say, we don't talk to the police at all. And I think there's a long-term sort of decrease in legitimacy when you say sort of, don't talk to the police, talk to me. Whereas in LA, they have this great sort of good cop, bad cop routine where they say, look, if you don't deal with us, you know, we're going to have to call the police in. And so let's squash this now. And the cops will actually say, go talk to the street workers, or else I'm going to have to handle this. Other, other questions? Yes? Um, I, I enjoyed your talk very much. Oh, thank you. You've stolen a lot from medicine. <laughs> yes. And it sounds as if you're struggling with predictive models. Yes. To try to really be able to predict the small group of that go after and do a training intervention. Yes. Otherwise, they spend too much money. Right. So, do they have more work in trying to identify the predictive factors rather than waiting until people are in the system? Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, so, the first thing is you correctly, I, so I often have a lot of um, uh, public health slides uh, up on this event, and just for brevity, I took them out. Um, and just so you know, like uh, it's very common in criminology to sort of aspire to the rigor of evidence. Uh, and so, and we use lots of medical analogies uh, and, uh, and, different, uh, and different things. So you, you picked up on that very well. One thing I would say about our predictive instruments, um, 
they're they're not very good in terms of you know sort of uh, minority report identifying you know some child in terms of in what they will do uh, later on in life, and that's probably a good thing in in in, in many ways. But you know, I don't think we're actually. I mean, the instruments that we have are already quite predictive because it's really no mystery who these people are. You know, the most dangerous people. Everybody knows who these people are in their neighborhoods. Everybody know it's not, a, and it's not a mystery. And you can see through their criminal histories. You know, you can see this uh, increasing, increasing pattern. So, in terms of identifying who's high risk, medium risk, and low risk, it really ain't no mystery. I mean, we just because the the community, the community knows. Uh, it's really more about creating a system that's nimble enough to respond to that. Um, that's really the challenge, is changing the, uh, the way we do business. So it's truly the intervention. We know what works. Moving from the education to getting the intervention to the right people at the right time. Right, and, and also getting people to, uh, to trust and believe that, um, in fact, crime is quite sticky. Because there's a lot of people who you know, also, you know, if you have a broader ag uh, agenda, and this is not your pet issue, you know, you'd like to bootstrap this, and you'd like to make this all about poverty, or you'd like to make it all about other values. I mean, you see Donald Trump doing that uh, in the debates, and to a certain extent, Hillary Clinton is doing that. They're weaving these issues in, in, into other things. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's a, um, and so that's a that's a challenge, and that's also the nature of political discourse. Everybody is trying to get their issue to be number one, uh, and you know get the political attention and resources focused on their issue as the primary issue, and others' issues as secondary. Yes. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Ryan Well, I mean, I, I, as someone in Massachusetts, uh, I, am, uh, I am jealous of you uh, in that you, you are all extremely politically relevant. Uh, so, you know, continue to do your civic duty, continue to vote and be uh, aware and select candidates that, uh, uh, that uh, you think represent, um, you know, uh, that seem conscientious about uh, the evidence and have concrete solutions. Um, I think that that's I think that's important, um, and uh, I think that's true at sort of all different levels. And I also think that you can get involved. Um, and you know, many of us uh, live in you know uh, working class or middle class or affluent neighborhoods. It was a really poor neighborhood, ten miles away, five miles away, one mile away. It can you know. And you can think about uh, engaging. In Memphis, one of the things that was really exciting is there's an incredibly strong faith-based community in Memphis. There's a church on every corner. And uh, interestingly, um, and the African-American clergy are intensely involved in sort of issues of black-on-black -black crime, very concerned about it, working on it all the time. But interestingly, in Memphis, as we started creating because I, uh, I worked on a, uh, a national anti-violence initiative for President Obama while I was in the Justice Department, and then I did the same thing when I was uh, the head of public safety for Governor Cuomo. Um, so you know, I've I've been all around the country working on working on this issue. But what we saw in Memphis is some of the white pastors and uh, reverends started getting involved, and they started bringing. Uh, their uh, their parishioners and other people into the inner city on the weekends to do touring, to do community events, and and those things. And what I would just say is, it's that kind of connectedness when we sort of start breaking down this sort of otherness of people um, that I think uh, that I think we can be uh, be successful. So I think it's important to you know think nationally and think globally, but also locally. Uh, sure. Um, thinking back 
so you know I uh, so I got my start as a I, I you know I work I was a teacher in a pretty rough uh, public school for a year and I was a prosecutor in New York City but for the for, I've been at a fairly high policy level for a while, so I haven't been sort of on the street, uh, daily interacting uh, with kids uh, for a while. I, you know, I think, I think that, I think one of the things that we don't, that we, uh, that we sort of often fail to do is we don't really <coughs> see these kids uh, and for for who they are and all their humanity. We also often place a filter on them. And I find that depending on your persuasion, that filter is either a negative filter or a positive filter. And neither one is really that effective. Any parent sort of loves their child but also sees their child making all kinds of mistakes. And so I think that it's important to really see them as a whole person and not to sort of neglect the real issues. I mean, the way I connect uh, to, you know, some of the kids that I, I mean, I remember I had a case with this gang called Dominicans Don't Play in, uh, in New York City, and uh, they had seen another gang member on the subway train and uh, had jumped him in rush hour. So they literally attacked him in front of everybody on the train, stabbed him many times near and I, when I was thinking about the you know, three or four youth who were there, you know, looking at me with dead eyes, no response, you know, those things, what I was trying to think about is, was not if this is an inherently good person or an inherently bad person, but think about what they've been through. And what would I be like if I had been through that? What if, you know, and you know, many of these uh, kids uh, have been through sort of polytrauma, meaning they've been maybe abused physically, possibly sexually. They've also witnessed violence in the community. They've also suffered from neglect. They've also had this. And that can really change the neural pathways in your brain. And it can basically tell you that the world is a dangerous place. And so one of the ways that you sort of hear about this when you ask about like why kids are hypervigilant in these circumstances, they're suffering from PST, PSTD. They're like Vietnam vets. And you know, one of once uh, once somebody said, you know, um, our fight and flight response systems are really good for sort of episodic threats. You know, the bear in the woods, um, and you can sort of you know fire all this cortisol into your system, and then it can deplete, and your system can return to normal. But what if the bear is your dad? You know, what happens then? And that's true, not and you know that's not true. And you know many people of all classes, of all its backgrounds, experience trauma in one form or another. And it's that constant firing that tells you like the world is uh, not a safe place. Never relax. You know, react to every provocation. And and what you have to do is you have to slowly chip away with. I think, you know, I hope that's helpful. Yes. So. Uh, you said that gun enforcement is moderately effective. Um, how do you enforce gun laws without essentially bullying a particular group? And uh, I have another question with regards to uh, the intervention tactics like uh, ceasefire and the So it seems like it seems like they, they've got an okay at mediation, but. There's a like an inherent problem in that sometimes some of these gang members, you know, like sometimes they're initiated very young. Uh, sometimes, you know, after a couple of years, you know, like uh, they may they might mature, they might want out, but they have a you know their self, you know, the gang self enforces, so it makes it difficult to you know to leave that environment. Um, they were asking about a kid. I, 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 I tutored a kid in Chicago two years ago, and I tutored a couple of gang members actually, and this particular kid was already winding out. And he was a freshman in high school, so I don't know at what age he was initiated. Having grown up in an area that had gangs, like I didn't know what to tell him. I said, like, my advice to him was, listen, start playing sports, uh, 
you know, uh, find a girlfriend. Not, not necessarily, I wasn't condoning that. I was just saying, find an excuse that they will consider legitimate for not hanging out with them. If it's a girlfriend, it's a girl, just hang out with her all the time. Don't make fun of you because of it. But it's a legitimate excuse, you know, if, you, if you're hanging out with a girl that you're infatuated with, that's a legitimate excuse to not come around. Yeah. If you're playing sports, that's also a legitimate excuse to not come around. But ultimately, there's, you know, ultimately there's no real way to get out. When I asked him if anyone had gotten out of his game, he said he'd seen one person get out and they beat him brutally and put him in the hospital. He didn't want to go, he didn't want to go through that. And two years later, so it was two years ago, uh, a year ago, he got, he got shot in the drive by. So here was a kid that wanted out, couldn't get out, you know? Um, and that's, yeah, and that's so sad because uh, it's such a sort of bad bargain. Uh, a lot of studies show that um, people join gangs mostly for protection, and yet when you join a gang, you become, you instantly become much higher risk for violence and victimization. Uh, and you're right, like most people, you know, sometimes when people get, you know, and, you know, um, it's actually not the case, that, you know, you hear these sort of stories about gangs being predatory and sort of, you know, grooming people early and trying to recruit members. It's usually not that easy to necessarily join a gang, and often gangs in the United States are not that structured. Even, uh, I've done work in Guatemala and El Salvador with MS-13 and 18th Street. Uh, you know, it's it's not, you know, you have to sort of audition uh, over time. But the interesting thing is, is that, you know, if you've been interested or often if, you know, your brother or your cousin or people you know were involved, you just sort of naturally migrate that way. A year or two in, you're like, this is not a good deal. I don't want to do this. But once you're in, it is, very, it is, it can be very hard to get out. I think your advice is actually pretty good. And it sort of, it resonates with the literature, which is, it's all about sort of positive social attachment, uh, attaching to positive people and positive institutions and positive activities. And you've got to have a good reason to not be in those risky places with those risky people. But it's very hard to alter those daily habits unless you have something concrete. So you can't, I think it's very hard if you know these guys are always around your neighborhood and you all of a sudden just say, I don't want to hang out anymore. You have to have more structure, not just as an explanation to them, but actually as motivation for you. And so I think that that's a, a, an important point. And then to your gun question, it's all about the specificity. So you don't want uh, you know, gun patrols roving an entire poor neighborhood. You want them to do the analysis. You, they want them to say, in this neighborhood, there are four or five, six hotspots, and we are going to be on that particular block. We are going to be on that particular corner. And the community is going to know. And you're going to explain to the community, here's why we're here. Here's why we're so aggressive in this one place and not everywhere else. The problem is when you, get, when you start to generalize. Uh, did you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, but part of the issue with that is that, like, let's say the hotspot is in a particular intersection, there's a corner store there, that's the nearest corner store. I mean, you could say, oh, well, you know, you could, you could tell people, like, listen, we're going to be, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, policing this area hard. So, like, if people, if it's a high traffic area, you're just naturally just going to get, you're naturally just going to, you know, just start picking out people because they want to based off appearances, unless you have specific people that you are targeting, well, you, you're just going to get people that are associated with, with other people, people who are relatives, or you know, right. or people who j you've just seen in the general area, and so it, it becomes a situation where you start getting a lot of innocent people. Um, right, and so what I would say is, is that there's no perfect solution. Um, but what I will say is that when the evidence shows that when you work with communities and you do these targeted strategies and you explain to them, they are actually welcoming that. And you and you know one of the things that people say, you know notice is that there are a lot of people in these poor communities who like stop and frisk, who feels more comfortable when there's this active uh, police presence. That doesn't mean that it's uh, always a good thing, but generally speaking, when communities feel that program is narrowly targeted targeted, and they've been consulted, then they welcome it. And they, for them, 
they think it's worth the cost benefit. If this is gonna reduce homicide, but I'm inconvenienced, but I'm not inconvenienced everywhere I go, and I can tell my son that when he walks around here, he can expect X, Y, Z, but not every time he leaves the house. Most people want that deal in those neighborhoods. That's what our experience is. All right. Thank you so much. On behalf of St. Anselm College and the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, here's a token of appreciation. Ah, thank you so much.